Well, if you were with us last week, um, you know that uh, the three weeks that Lonnie and Sharon will be gone, I'm going to go through uh, psalms, different psalms. And uh, if you were, again, if you were with us last week, um, one, of the, one of the things I mentioned was, was favorite psalms. And there are, there are favorite psalms that we could all call out this morning and say, oh yeah, I, I, I go back to this psalm when I, when I have real needs and when I am, when I am in, in real need of comfort or whatever it might be, we find ourselves turning to certain psalms. And the psalm I mentioned was Psalm 34. And that's the psalm that, that we want to go through this morning as we look at David and, and how he responded to certain events in his life. And I entitled this, the, the message this morning, our study, Living a Life of Fear. And, and uh, as I, I think you'll understand it as, as we go through here, there's a, there's a lot of fears that are talked about in this passage. And it is as though he is calling us to live a life of fear, but perhaps it's not the fear that we've been um, most accustomed to. Because David starts with a, a, a few verses at the very beginning that I would call a summary of what is yet to come. A summary of, of, of what is yet to follow in Psalm 34. And it is this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. It's like he, like he bursts out into song as he, as he begins to write this psalm. This is, this is the summary. And I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. Now, I read that and I thought, hmm at all times how does a person ever get there how does a person ever get there in their life where they would where they would in 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 truth in honesty um, say something like this I will bless the Lord at all times and I think and I think to understand that you have to if, if you've got your Bible open by the way it's on page 496 in the in the, the Bible that's in front of you there Psalm 34 but if you've got your Bible open, chances are at the top of it, there is something that is worded this way. Of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. These prescripts, or whatever you might call them, the, the preface to these psalms, have survived over the thousands of years and come with this psalm. This wasn't invented afterwards. But, but as David wrote this, this, is, this was the event that surrounded. So I think in order to understand how did, some, how did David get to the point that he was able to say, I will bless the Lord at all times, I think we've got to go back in history a little bit and look at how David personally got to this point in his life and the events that, the events that led up to this. So Abimelech, you will, you will see Abimelech, and later on you will see Achish, as as two as references to the same individual abimelech was a title there are lots of abimelechs not so many today but there were lots of abimelechs back then and that was a and that was a title that was given to somebody akish was the individual's name so his his name was akish and you'll see this interchangeably as you as you go through here but it is within the context of first samuel 21 10 through 15 that we find um, this event unfold when Abimelech drove him out and David went away. This is what it says. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath, a Philistine, by the way, another Gath being in, in Philistia. And the servants of Achish said to him, is not this David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen? that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? This fellow shall come into my house? Shall this fellow come into my house? 
So David was being deceitful in how he handled this situation in Gath. So, so you know, how did, how did he even get here? And there's a, there's a, there is a series of events, I think, that, that is instructive as we, as we take a look at this. Obviously, David comes onto the scene in 1 Samuel 17, and that is David killing Goliath. We know the story, right? Young, a young boy, actually, uh, the youngest of all of these brothers. He was out in the field tending sheep, like, who's he? And they bring him in, and Samuel anoints him. And then he ends up fighting Goliath. He says, okay, we will, I will take on Goliath here. And by the way, I don't want a sword. I can't wear this armor. I don't want, I don't want a spear. I don't want a shield. I'm just going to take these stones. And I am going to go because the Lord is with me. And that's where we see David beginning. So, needless to say, Saul thinks this guy has potential. Brings him in, brings him into the palace, but over time he he grows, David grows, and he is very successful as a leader of the military, and Saul becomes jealous. Saul the king becomes jealous of David because he's getting a lot more attention than Saul. People are saying, as as we saw before, Saul killed his thousands, David kills his ten thousands, much more successful, and Saul launches a spear at him one day. He's, he is in his presence, and he is jealous. Saul is jealous and launches a spear. And from that point on, David starts running and is very much afraid. Samuel, 1 Samuel 19, uh, his wife, Michael, lets him down out of a window. She's the daughter of Saul. Marries, marries the daughter of Saul, knows that Saul is chasing him, knows that Saul wants to kill him, lets him down out of the window, and then deceives her father by putting a dummy in the bed. So they come in and go, well, David's still here. Wrong, David's gone. And deceives Saul, Michael does this, his wife. Then in 1 Samuel 20, David asked Jonathan to lie. So there's a banquet that is being given. And well, where's David? Because Saul wants to kill him. Where's David? Well. Jonathan lies to Saul and says he's out on a very, very important mission. But David asked Jonathan to lie. And so there's a series of deceptions that's going on here. Now I'm going to jump down to 1 Samuel 22 because it's actually after this 1 Samuel 21 incident. 1 Samuel 22, Ahimelech, not to be confused with Abimelech, Ahimelech is, the, is a priest. And he, and he after, after running from Philistia, after being sent out and, and, and sent away, he then ends up going to Ahimelech. And where, when he runs into Ahimelech, he lies to Ahimelech and says, I'm on a special mission from Saul. And I need the showbread that you've got there, this consecrated bread. And we're ravishingly hungry. And, and we need that. And he eats of that. He eats that bread. Saul finds out that David was there. And he goes into this town called Nob and wipes out the town. Women, children, wipes them out. Very angry. And 85 priests are killed as a result, as a result of David's deception. And in verse 22 of Samuel, of 1 Samuel 22, David admits that he was the cause of all those deaths. So then you go back to this deceiving the people of Gath in 1 Samuel 21, and, and he, he intentionally tries to deceive the king, Achish, all those around and say, I'm, I'm mad. And, and it says here, he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. All deception was occurring. Starting, I mean, from where he was killing Goliath, I don't need a sword, I don't need a spear, I don't need a shield. We see a whole series of deception where, born of fear, justifiable, he had a, he had a spear hurled at him, and he knows that Saul, if he finds him, he will kill him. Born of fear of Saul, he begins a series of deceptions. 
Now we have to ask ourselves the question, is that clever on David's part? Is he just being clever? Or is there something else going on in David's life that is causing him to fear, where, where you didn't see that with Goliath, where he's now causing him to be afraid, running, involving deception. It's an interesting study because there is another psalm, and it is Psalm 56. And again, if you've got your Bible in front of you, it's, it's page 509. But Psalm 56 is the same incident as Psalm 34. We know that because there is a, 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 um, a right ahead of it, it describes it to the choir master, according to the dove on far off terebinths, a victim of David, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. When the Philistines seized him in Gath. And it's interesting because this psalm talks a lot about fear. And it comes at it a little bit differently. So we've got this, we've got this series of deceptions that has occurred, leading to the line of the line to Ahimelech, the priest, and 85 priests being killed, and Nob being wiped out. And it is, it, is, it is believed that Psalm 56 now is written after that as David reflects back on this period of time where he was running and afraid. Look, look at this. It's, it's in Psalm 56. Let's just read down through this one. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? What, 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 wait, 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 wait. What can flesh do to me? I mean, he has been, he's been chased and chased and chased and chased, very much afraid of the king of Gath, very much afraid of Saul. But now he's saying something different. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime, will they escape? In wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. You have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the, lot of li in, in the light of life. These words are repeated in that psalm. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And he says it again. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? So it is as though after this period of time when he'd been running, terrified for his life, deceiving everybody around him, he pauses and says, Whatever was going on back then in my life was not proper. Fearing man, fearing God, where should, I, where should I be in life? I think it's important because it appears as though, like I say, that this, that this was written before Psalm 34. I have come to this conclusion. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And then he comes and he writes Psalm 34. Because in Psalm 34, there is a word that is repeated throughout. And it is called, and the word is deliver. Deliver. I am delivered. And you'll see it as, as we go through here. The challenge we have this morning, though, in looking at Psalm 34. Now that we understand that historical background, the challenge we have in Psalm 34 is an understanding of what is David's personal testimony as it relates to this specific incident where he feigned madness and, and the king of Gath, Achish, sent him away. What is specific personal testimony to that 
and what is normative for our life. In other words, in other words, can we look at, at Psalm 34 and say, that is what I can expect in my life. Just as David escaped, just as David was relieved of all these, of, of all the troubles, can I expect that in my life? And if not, what can, what can I expect? And here is where he starts. We have read the first three verses, but now in verses four through seven, it says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. This is a lament. This is what a lament is called. And there's three pieces to that. I sought the Lord, he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Now, when you read that, you say, okay, that can be understood a little bit differently. So delivered me from all my fears, delivered me from everything I'm afraid of, or delivered me from my fears of those things that I'm afraid of. And I think if you take a look again, as we looked at Psalm 56, as we take a look at that Psalm and, and we go back to that, it appears as though he is referencing his personal fears. I have been delivered from my fears, from being terrified, from being afraid. Now, how? Well, it said it, in God whom I trust, in God I will trust. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? God, in God whom I trust, in, in, in understanding he is the one who protects, I would say that, there are, that this is the first way that David uses the word delivered in this psalm. We are, he is, delivered from fears. He is delivered, he is delivered from fears. But, the, but then in verse 6, he says, This poor man cried, David, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And there we kind of go, oh, okay, I understand the first part. I know that trusting in God, placing my life in his hands, is the quickest way to reduce fears. He is trustworthy. But now, he says, he delivers from all my troubles. This poor man cried, the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Now, we know historically, in this, in this incident, he was saved out of his troubles. Is that something that we can expect from God? As we cry out and say, God, get me out of this situation. Get me out of this trouble. Is that something that we can expect? Is this what I say? Is this normative? Is this teaching us that we can expect this very thing? Because the second way that he uses deliver here is he's physically delivered from his troubles. Now this is a perfect example, I think, of when we come to scripture and we look at something and we kind of say, that doesn't jive with my experience. Where do you go? I have been praying to get me out of this situation for years and years and years. Now, whether it be health, finance, relationships, add to the list, all those things that we find very stressful in troubles, fear, those things that we are in deep fear of, keep us awake at night, wake us up at night, all of those things, God get me out of my troubles and he hasn't so we can come to a passage like this and we can say well I guess it's wrong I guess scripture's wrong it could be one conclusion then or whatever not working for me maybe he doesn't hear me whatever it might be or we can say maybe we don't understand this passage yet maybe it's not that it's wrong maybe it's that we don't understand this passage so 
does he deliver us from troubles? When we, this poor man cries out, when we cry out, does he deliver us from troubles? And I think, I think probably one of the best ways to answer that question is for us to take a look at the life of Christ. Was he delivered from suffering? No. No. We know that, right? He was not delivered from his troubles. Physically removed from his suffering. Was he delivered from struggling? No. We see him crying out. We see him anguishing over issues. No. Was he delivered from pain? No. We see him hunger. We see him thirst. We see him die. Was he delivered from pain? No. Was he delivered from stress? No. You look at the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, he is in anguish over what is about to happen. You know, let this cup pass. Don't, you know, if, don't, don't, I don't want to experience what is about to happen. Was he delivered from stress? No, he was not. Was he delivered from dangerous situations? Well, here's where it's kind of interesting. Yes and no. Yes, yes. There's a passage in, in John 10, 30 through 39. He starts this passage in verse 30 and says, I and the Father are one. Their response immediately is the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. So they're ready to kill him right there on the spot. They believe that they have the cause, blasphemy. I and the Father are one. He just called himself God. And so they pick up stones ready to stone him. He's in serious situation. But then it goes on. He talks more to him. He says, you're accusing me of blasphemy, but I'm doing the works of, the, of my father. You don't believe him, but that's what's going on. In verse 39, again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. But he escaped from their hands. It wasn't, he, he wasn't stoned. And, and we know, of course, now in hindsight, looking back, that it wasn't time. That it wasn't time for his death and that wasn't the manner of death that he was going to suffer and so yeah God God pulled him out of his troubles he was delivered from dangerous situations Matthew 20 18 however when he turns to his disciples and says we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death I am going to die I'm going to die, knowing that he was not going to be removed from his troubles. The troubles were coming, and it was time to experience those. So what does this teach us? This second one, delivered me from all my troubles. Does he deliver us from our troubles? And I think if you look at the life of Christ, you would say this. Sometimes God does physically deliver us from troubles, but not always. Sometimes he does. He delivered David. We see it in the life of Christ. He delivered him from his troubles. We see it in the life of the apostles. There are times when they're in prison and the doors open up and angels appear and they walk out singing praises and all everybody lived happily ever after, of course, until they were martyred when they weren't delivered from their troubles. But we can also say this, when you, look at, when you look at Christ, we can say this, whether he does or doesn't deliver us from our troubles is not a matter of lacking faith. Jesus Christ had all the faith necessary. He was in absolute perfect sync with the will of God. He knew the Father's mind, and, and he was not delivered from all of his troubles. It is not a matter of lacking faith. It is not a consequence of sinning or not sinning. So you say, if I were just better, maybe he would deliver me from my troubles. 
Well, what do, you, what, do you, what do you say, Jesus Christ? Could he have been any better? He was perfect, never sinned. So that doesn't jive. And then, and then maybe, if it, maybe he's not delivering from my troubles because I'm sinning. But, but David was in the midst of sinning, in the midst of deceit, when he was delivered from his troubles. It's a problem. But what we can say is that it is directly the result of his will for our lives. Whether he does or doesn't remove us, deliver us from our troubles, is directly tied to his will for our lives, as it was directly tied to his will for Jesus Christ. It was time. Now there were other times when he walked through the crowds. There were times when the disciples just walked away. And there were other times they were stoned. There were other times they were beaten and then released. But directly tied to his will for our lives. And this is where when we come to a psalm like this, we say, is this David's personal testimony of an incident that occurred at that moment in his life when he is giving praise for he delivered me from all my troubles? And then we say, is that something that we should expect from God? And I think that this is a personal testimony of David for this particular moment. And yes, absolutely, God do, did deliver him from all of his troubles. And he gave praise to God for that deliverance. But now he, but now he moves on to verse 8. And he goes into this second use of the word fear. So he has been delivered, he delivered me in verse 4 from all of my fears. And now he says in verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Seriously, David? <laughs> Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit? He has been filled with deceit as he ran from Saul. He has been filled with fears as he ran from Saul. But he has learned something. He has learned something from that experience. And now he turns back and says, fear the Lord. Now what's fear, right? Fear, a lot of definitions of fear. I, I, I say it this way, recognition that he's God and we are not. His will, not mine. Recognition that he is God and we are not. Fear, fear the Lord. He uses this young lion illustration here. A young lion being that, that, that epitome of strength. The young lion who can go out and he's stronger than just about anything, can kill it, can eat it, whatever he wants, he can take. And he says, young lions go hungry. The young lions suffer want and hunger. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Fearing God delivers us from our fears. We know that. But now he goes on to say, we will lack no good thing. God desires to give us what we need. Everything that we need to accomplish His will. His will, His timing, fearing God. And within that fear of God, within that relationship with God, we find ourselves losing our fears, settling down, resting, gaining confidence that this is the God who wants us who wants us to lack no good thing give us what we need to accomplish his will and that is our life then and he goes on and he says he says and it is a life of peace turn away from evil and do good seek peace and pursue it we find it in that relationship now there is one other deliverance that he references now in verses 15 uh, through the end of the chapter. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. 
When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. The last deliverance is found there in verse 22. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. And the third deliverance that he talks about here is being delivered from condemnation. So we've seen deliver from fears. We've seen deliver from troubles. We've seen now deliver from condemnation. It, it's interesting that verse 20, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. We know now that he was referring to Jesus Christ on the cross. That when it was time for to make sure that he was dead, they would do that. They did that to the two uh, criminals on either side of him. But when they came to him, he was already dead and not one of his bones were broken. I say good news, but he died. But he died. Not removed from all of his troubles, but kept. Kept to the end. Saved. Our final, our final deliverance. You know, the word condemn there in verse, in verse 21 and 22. Those who hate the righteous will be condemned. And, those, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. But it's the same word. And the word condemned means it is, it is held guilty. So to the one who hates the righteous, they are held guilty. To the one who takes refuge in him, they will not be held guilty. They will not be condemned. But they are guilty, right? Last week when we talked about Psalm 1, we talked about the wicked and the righteous. And that not being directly related to their behavior, but rather to God's labels. The wicked and the righteous. And, and how do you find yourself in those, in those groups as referred to by God, wicked and righteous. Well, we know now, of course, how that happens. We know now that it was, it is for those who have, for those who have taken on the righteousness of Jesus Christ by, by trusting in His death in our place, by placing our faith in Him to save us, to deliver us from condemnation. We find ourselves being placed in this category called righteous because he is righteous and we have taken his righteousness for ours. But the wicked who have not done that, while they exhibit wicked behaviors, it's, it's a category of people who have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And those will not escape condemnation. So the final one, these three delivers. Deliver from our fears. Always available to us. Always available to us. Now, David, I would say, it is not as though a switch is thrown and you suddenly have no fears. I think what David was saying here, this fear of man, this fear of being chased, this fear of somebody is going to kill me tomorrow, Somebody is going to get to me. He came to some closure on that as we saw in Psalm 56. I will trust in God. What can man do to me? I'm going to put my, I'm going to put my trust in God. And that fear appears to be one that he has probably checked off. Did he have other fears? Other fears? Do we have other fears? It, it, it appears as though that that as we as we progress in our growth as a believer as we as we grow in greater appreciation of the trustworthiness of God and our ability to put our faith in God versus ourselves our ability to handle these difficult situations difficult relationships our health our money whatever it might be we find ourselves being able to rest more but it's progressive and I say it's, 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 it's not a switch, 
it's a relationship. It is something that we grow in over time as we find that the God who is able to push our fears away is a God who can be trusted. Very, very important. Delivery from fear. Delivery from troubles, situational, depending upon God's will for our lives. There are times when we are removed from troubles. There are times when we don't, we're not even aware. I mean, it, earlier, earlier in, this, in this passage, it talked in verse 7, the angel of the Lord, reference to Jesus Christ himself, encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. We're not even aware of what God is doing behind the scenes, invisible to us, protecting us. We've, we've all been in those situations where we said, had I been just a minute earlier, I would have been in that accident. Why wasn't I there? Well, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. God is there protecting. God is there preventing. And there's times that he delivers us from troubles and other times we are in car accidents. Situational, depending upon his will. But the last one, is all of ours. Deliverance from condemnation. It is available to every one of us in this room. To be declared righteous is our gift, but it's a choice. We know that. It's a choice that we have to make. It's not automatic. It doesn't just happen. It is a choice. It is a decision on our part to trust Jesus Christ to save us from that condemnation. The condemnation that will surely come. The condemnation that everybody is held guilty, start guilty, and then suddenly there are some, because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that are no longer held guilty. It's a gift. We know that. He is our deliverer. So we started this morning looking at those first three verses. And we said, how does a person ever get to this point in their life? That they would be able to say, I will praise the Lord at all times. And I think as we've kind of looked at this, as we looked at this passage and looked at what David was going through, he was ref referencing this deliverance from our fears, from troubles, according to God's will, but always from condemnation. Those who take refuge in him, none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So let's read this again. This is the first three verses once again. Let's read this together. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. This week, as you considered the word deliver, not referencing pizza, consider the word deliver. I think you can think back to Psalm 34 and say, I will bless the Lord at all times. Deliverance from condemnation. Oh, praise God. Let's pray. Thank you for your word this morning, Father. Thank you for the truthfulness of your word. Thank you for the deliverance that is offered to us. And we know, Father, there are times that we are deep in our troubles. And we are deep in our fears. We know that you offer that in our, in, to us, the deliverance from our fears and in our relationship with you. Drive that trust and drive that faith deeper into our life that we might live a life without that fear, but always in fear of you putting you on the throne, making sure that we remember over and over again that you are God and we are not. And thank you for the times, Father, when you do deliver us from our troubles, when we cry out to you and we say, I don't think I can take this anymore. And you do walk us through it and we're out the other side and we look back and we remember your deliverance from those troubles. But that we might submit to your will for our lives as Jesus Christ did for his life before you as well. And deliverance always from condemnation. 
Father, if there are people sitting here this morning that are still wrestling with whether to put their faith in you or not, I would pray that you touch their hearts, that you open their eyes, that you make them see all that you have to offer. Freedom, deliverance from condemnation. None of those who put their faith in you will ever be condemned. Precious promise, Father. Your praise will always be in our mouths. In your name.